Now you can hear, hear the, um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce my colleague at GSAP, who many of you in the audience know, um, Vishan Chakrabarty, who's going to facilitate and chair um, our next panel on um, thinking about financing um, and making happen waterfront development. Great. Thank you, Kate. Can everyone hear me? Uh, so this is the rough and tough panel, right, the, d the developers. Tell me that. Right, yeah, this is the rough and tough panel uh, of uh, the folks who actually go out and build on our waterfronts across the world. And get bankrupt. And get bankrupt, <laughs> I hope not. Um, and um, I think one of the things that we really want to explore with this panel is what really makes development different along the waterfront? How is it different from developing along the inland or elsewhere? What kind of risks are uh, really uh, very distinct in dealing with waterfronts? Uh, what are you know the financing mechanisms that are different, the regulatory mechanisms that are different, and I think in that the very special issue of how is it that the relationship with the public is different, um, and I mean that in two different ways, which is how is the relationship with the public sector, government, different, and how is the relationship with the public at large different as a consequence of building on the water. Uh, and also, I think it would be good to touch on issues of sort of design and land use, which I think is a particularly interesting question for waterfront developments. Uh, and, and lastly, affordability and access and who is the waterfront for in these various visions uh, that you're going to present. So uh, really, from uh, right to left, uh, Sardar Bilgili, who's the chairman of Bilgili Holdings, uh, and he's going to go first. Uh, my good friend Surendra Hernandani, uh, who's the founder of the uh, Hernandani Group from Mumbai, uh, from Istanbul, of course, is uh, Serdar. Uh, my friend from many, many years back, <laughs> Paul Janizewski, who uh, is the Vice President for Planning and Government and Relations at Rockrose, a major developer here, but also has worked in uh, numerous governmental capacities having to do with the waterfront. And so he can really touch on both the public and private role. And then Gregory Vaca, Greg is from Tishman Spire in Rio de Janeiro and is leading a major uh, waterfront redevelopment there. So with no further ado, Sir Art, so you could take it away. Thank you so much. And uh, one more time, I, I really appreciate being here and thank you for inviting me. Um, let me see how this works. Okay. So I, I was very lucky to be a part of, I think, one of the biggest and uh, most important projects, I should say, of Europe right now, of real estate projects. It, it, it involves waterfront development, it involves restoration of historic uh, properties, and it actually involves changing the city life of a major metropolitan city in Europe. Uh, if you allow me, I, will, I want to stand up. So, uh, as you have seen uh, from uh, Professor Gercek's uh, uh, presentation, Istanbul actually is 14 million people officially, but unofficially probably we are around 18 million people. So that makes Istanbul probably the largest city in Europe right now. And, but luckily we are located uh, in such a special geographical uh, place that the city is surrounded by water. And in the middle of the city we have a sea that is, uh, in the middle of the city there is a sea channel that's dividing the city into two between Europe and Asia. And this area, which is the entrance of the Golden Horn, the entrance of the Bosphorus, is where all the, um, I should say, his, wh whatever there is of architecture from Ottoman Empire is located in this area. So the Galata Tower, the Blue Mosque, the Sleimania Mosque, these are all located in this area. And we are very lucky to be able to get a waterfront land of 1.2 kilometers waterfront in the center of this location. So this property is about uh, 150,000 square meter land. As I've said, it's thin and long. It has a 1.2 kilometer of waterfront. Uh, at the moment, we have some existing historic buildings and there are warehouses, uh, which is also used as the cruise ship port of Istanbul. It's the only cruise ship port that exists right now in the city. And unfortunately, it is in a very bad shape. And uh, let me see. I want to actually show you what it was before in the historic times. This is uh, part of the uh, development, and this is what it looked like. This is probably about seven, eight hundred years ago. Uh, so, just to show you, the 1.2 kilometer waterfront is consisting 
of a very luxury hotel, which is going to be the top hotel in Istanbul. Um, and this is restoring of the existing uh, old buildings. Uh, we will have um, actually the Istanbul Modern, which is the most important um, uh, modern museum of Turkey, I should say, it's the MoMA of Turkey, is located in our property and it's, uh, uh, we will probably rebuild it and uh, uh, e extend it and enlarge it. There's another museum which is a part of the uh, uh, Istanbul University and the project will cover a lot of uh, retail, uh, offices, uh, restaurants, and the most important, an area that is covered to public right now will be open to public. So there will be a lot of public spaces, there will be parks, um, and uh, Istanbul people, although they are living on the waterfront, unfortunately they are not using the waterfront as much. So basically the city will meet uh, the water here. So this is a view uh, of the property. So this is the start. This is so these three buildings plus this is going to be the uh, luxury uh, hotel, and uh, this will be some luxury uh, uh, retail. And then this is the Istanbul Modern Museum, and these are the ugly warehouses which are really not used at all right now. And this whole area, as I've said, is covered uh, by, by walls. And right now, you don't even see the water in this area. I want to show some more uh, photographs. What you see behind is the Galata Tower uh, of Istanbul, which is from 500. Uh, very, very historic, beautiful uh, tower. And these are the three old buildings which will be restored and turned into a hotel. This is a continu continuation. This is the Istanbul Modern Museum, which will be rebuilt, and the warehouses uh, from a closer perspective. At the moment, this property is used as the uh, cruise ship port of Istanbul. So in the summer times, we get about five uh, to six uh, huge cruise ship ports. And um, in the uh, uh, winter time, it's quite, uh, it, it's quite uh, calm. And what we are doing now with the new development, the cruise ship port terminal will be taken under the ground. And uh, this area, which is normally a, a duty-free zone right now, it will be open to public. So our goal here is to uh, make the city of Istanbul, the people of Istanbul, enjoy the waterfront uh, and with the historic uh, background. Some more photographs, and I will share with you what the new look like. Uh, what the new uh, the design will look like. This is not final. We are still working on it. We have uh, uh, actually hired six major architectural firms internationally, top, top 50, uh, to do the project. Uh, uh, they did their first initial designs. And finally, we have uh, selected a combination of Dror, who's a very important uh, uh, designer, and uh, Genzer, which is one of the largest architectural firms, they combine together uh, to develop this project. So uh, the project will have a lot of public spaces. The design was the main issue here because it is located so uh, important uh, location because you have the historic uh, sites around you. So the design should be respecting the history, but it should be contemporary. But at the same time, it should be understated. So, I think uh, this design is going on that direction uh, without losing the background sites of the Topkapı Palace and the Blue Mosque. And uh, it also has to be uh, the feeling of the luxury, but as I've uh, mentioned, uh, quite un uh, understated, uh, with the use of Turkish materials, stones, uh, bricks, or uh, concrete uh, as on the facade. And this is uh, a look of how the restoration is going to look like. So j just want to give you uh, a brief, uh, some numbers. This project is going to be approximately uh, 200,000 leasable area. And the total investment is $1.2 billion. Uh, I don't want to go into the financing. My time is over. So if there are questions, I will try to answer them okay. afterwards. Thank Terrific. you so much. Thank you.
had a question. Are they high rises or low rises? All of them low rises. All low rises. Yes. It's, 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 it's all going to be low rises because we want to uh, respect the existing historical buildings, the uh, existing surrounding. And um, as I've said, it, this area is the old Istanbul, the history of Istanbul, and the buildings should be respected. What's the built-up area? It is 200,000 square meter. Please. OK. Surrender. <laughs> so uh, very happy to be here, very excited. I'm from Mumbai. I'm born in Mumbai, studied in Mumbai. Whatever I am is because of Mumbai. There's nothing never. My kids have studied in the US, but not me. And uh, my father was a refugee from what is now Pakistan, studied as a doctor, suffered from malnutrition and poverty as a child, and uh, lived in Mumbai, died last September at the age of 96, that too because of Parkinson, with genes I hope I don't get. <laughs> but it just goes to show that we have all these photos showing it's a polluted, congested city, but it's probably more healthy living there than elsewhere. So, uh, you know, this is, uh, I just brought one of our developments. Uh, we have a couple of developments. Along the ocean waterfront is, uh, you know, I've done individual buildings. Though in the city of Chennai, I've, done, I've got a 100-acre nice waterfront development going on. Uh, but in Mumbai, uh, but I have got around the lake. So we have developed a large 200-acre project around the lake, which we started in 91. Uh, it took about 10 years. Uh, almost, uh, you know, escaped from bankruptcy three times before we reached a cycle of self-sustenance. And uh, Mumbai, as you know, is a city which is, of course, the financial capital we know. It's the film industry capital. It's uh, where India's first atomic bomb was built. Uh, it's the headquarters of the Indian Navy. It's the pharma capital. Uh, I just did a building for Huntsman Laboratories uh, in Mumbai, uh, they're shifting their R&D headquarters from uh, Switzerland to Mumbai. Uh, then uh, we have, uh, you know, every, uh, so many other shipping, oil field services. A lot of my tenants are oil field services people. So, where is the, uh, you know, the discussion is what are the problems? We're not talking about the successes and the. Uh, good things, but uh, what, where are the problems? Uh, investing in the public dream, uh, creating affordable housing, basic infrastructure, and investment in public transit. But having said that, please note that in Mumbai, 70% uh, of the population uses public transport, and 8 million people every day use public transport. So it's not that we don't have public transport. The city is great because of public transport. What it lacks is that it's on an arterial grid. So you know, the morning and the evening, getting into the public transport, reaching there at those nodes is the critical thing. It needs to be spread out in a grid so that public transport is you know, walkable. And uh, being a congested city, uh, BRT is not an option. Uh, you have to be looking at high-speed rail metro rail systems. Uh, we have fantastic uh, waterfronts, uh, and uh, the, obviously the uh, properties along the water are always at a premium. Uh, I guess that's everywhere in the world. And uh, we, this is one of the communities we built uh, starting in 91, where it's mixed use, residential and commercial. This was the land when we took the land. Okay, it was a full quarried land. Unfortunately, I didn't keep so many photos those days. But this is what the land was. Not a single tree. It was all quarry land, barren land, nothing out there. Uh, there were bootleggers out there. And uh, quite dangerous to be there alone. So this is what we built on it, a uh, whole community. And uh, in just in this project, I have uh, you know, about 6,000 residences, uh, but we also have 165 multinationals here, including Colgate headquarters, Bayer, Bayer of Germany headquarters, Standard & Poor headquarters, and uh, back offices of JP Morgan and dozens of others. Shipping, pharma, uh, oil field services. Uh, and this was never to be, uh, as per the original plan, a commercial center. And today, we did manage to create a commercial center. 
So this is the whole uh, you know, master plan which really evolved. Uh, it's not genius. It's uh, a lot of mistakes you make, you learn along the way. Uh, if you go back to what I did in 91, I think I could have done better, so many things. But uh, you, the important thing is to keep improving and uh, making it good. But what I want to bring about is, is that the success of the place is, is that we created public spaces within the project, uh, which we created a fund from the, all the you know, residents and from the leases. Uh, we have a fund, which actually we are supposed to hand over these public spaces to the city, but we have taken it over and we maintain it with recycled water uh, through our own uh, landscaping team. And the most important thing is the biggest success of the project is, is the high street. Without that, I don't think the complex would have had, the project would have had a soul. The soul of the project, crazily, is not the lakefront. You know, the, uh, we tried to do something on the lakefront and those activists thought that we want to build something and they said, get the private developers out. So the government did a nice walkway around it, but it's lonely and it's hardly used. It's only uh, good for looking at while you're driving past. But a high street is what is, uh, you know, really contributed. So we have a whole street of, uh, you know, restaurants pr primarily. You know, it's a suburban, it's technically a suburban uh, location. So it's, uh, you know, the, what has really made it successful are the restaurants. So on this street, we get as good rentals as the most uh, active parts of the city. The rentals, because the occupancy and the crowd there is the same. So we got, uh, since we got mixed use, you got the, you know, it's busy in the day and is busy at the night with the residences. Uh, we, uh, we have a charitable trust which runs the hospital, my dad's doctor, so it's named after him. This is the first school building, then we have made another school building. We run three schools presently in the country. Um, uh, surprisingly, my youngest daughter goes to a school where now the principal is a Russian man and is full of expat teachers. In one of our schools, we just recruited a principal from New Zealand we got teachers from Germany, uh, Australia, uh, England, New Zealand. So this is just, see, the high street is what I feel is my, you know, real success of the project. We have so many other streets, but this, uh, we just call it Central Avenue. So gardens and open green spaces define and connect different sectors, grading. This is one of my friends did it for me. This, so, that also started master plan. Yeah. Okay. So, within the landscaping, uh, you know, uh, we love the public art. You know, India is full of sculptures, very cheap to get things done by hand. Oh, getting over. Sorry. So, let's go on. Just the public art is very important. That's the emphasis. Uh, so, if you're doing waterfront development, public art is, that's a real rainbow. <laughs> and uh, just see, this all, we done this, we got these French, French guys living in Pondicherry, so they give these sculptures, guys, inputs on, you know, Indo-Western art. And uh, so looking at the city, we are practically somewhere here. And the, the city which everybody talks about was here. So we are in this deep location where we managed to attract so many offices. Uh, in, by the way, we are one of four cities in the world which has a national park in the city, like Hong Kong, uh, Rio, uh, Mumbai, and Nairobi. Uh, so uh, uh, every, uh, every year about 15 to 20 people get killed by the leopards. <laughs> and this lake over here which we overlook has crocodiles. Uh, just two years back, one of my elevator mechanics went fishing there in the morning and got killed. <laughs> so this is a waterfront development in uh, uh, Chennai, which we did. Now, what do we do with the waterfront? You know, this is not downtown as such. So we decided that sports facilities are the best. 
various reasons. There's a water crunch there, Chennai is short of water. And this grass is uh, coincidentally uh, not imported from China, but from the United States of America, the seedlings. It's seawater grass. And we get crazy people from the building who say oh, that we're going to complain to the authorities because they notice the water levels going down at times, thinking that we're drawing so much water for the grass that uh, we're disturbing the creek which runs along our property. But it's obviously the tides which go up and down. So you can see the tennis courts. The, we have basketball courts. So we have lined up six tennis courts, four basketball courts, uh, football ground, cricket, of course, in India. Cricket is number one. Uh, coming to the waterfront, uh, there are a number of architects who have you know, put up proposals on how the waterfront could be. I'm not saying this is the way it should be done, but this is what I could get hold of. Is, uh, but you know, it's really a landscaping exercise. And uh, you do anything on the waterfront, uh, it's going to be attractive to people. Uh, the, and uh, coming to the, I think the last point is that uh, there's a huge scope in the city to reclaim land and get revenue. And uh, I mean, it's very easy. This, this particular spot, I've just marked it theoretically. I'm not saying this is what needs to be reclaimed. But this could easily generate uh, um, you know, uh, about uh, one and a half to two billion dollars of positive revenue for the city, but 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 what the city needs to do is to make non-automobile oriented development. We have crazy laws which make uh, you know the, the when we discuss with the politicians, they say no, that's what the people want, and they made the development rules such that uh, we have to provide huge amounts of car parking for our buildings, which is equal to amount of built up space in which people live in which is equivalent to dollar a gallon gasoline buildings in the Middle East, uh, uh, you know, that kind of architecture, and what is equivalent to what is in suburban America. So I attended the seminar on some urban traffic institute, and they were giving out figures that, you know, India is on par with the US. I said, which part of the US? New York City doesn't have it. So, they, you know, they were comparing suburban USA and saying that, uh, you know, the government of India has put rules for Mumbai city, which is on par with suburban Mumbai. And that's a mindset which is a big challenge. And this is what really, you know, I would love that Studio X and everybody else here gets involved and explains the common man, explains the politician that the future of the city is without private automobiles. Please work on that. Reclaim as much land as you want, get the revenue, but invest it in public transport, invest in walkable communities. Of course, make roads. We need the ambulance, we need the trucks, we need the uh, buses. Of course, you need the roads, but you uh, also need the high speed trains. And uh, we have the youngest population in the world below 35 years. Uh, it's, I mean, it's, the future is fantastic if everything is harnessed well. Thank you. Paul, yes. <laughs> any crocodiles in Queens? No, I was thinking, I thought we had every uh, obstacle there, but uh, no uh, deaths by wild animals. Anyway. Yeah. Um, anyway, I'm Paul Januszewski. I am working for Rock Rose now, which is a private developer, but I have a background with the city and the state. And I was actually just thinking here for the first time, I've worked for, all, I've worked for the city, the state, the Port Authority, and Rock Rose. So those are all of the uh, parties who have been involved here. So. I have a few different hats, but most of what I'm talking about now is uh, from my Queens West uh, experience. So this is just a picture to show the site. It's already pretty outdated, but I like it because it shows how close it is to Midtown. It's only uh, one stop away from Grand Central on the 7 train. Uh, it, 74 acres of land altogether that used to be uh, manufacturing. Uh, this is some of the historic conditions, as I think Mark and Kate were saying in the beginning, that this was a port before it was a city, and most of the transportation of goods and raw materials happened along the waterfront. And so the waterfront became where all of the you know, undesirable uses were pushed. Uh, 
power plants, oil refineries, slaughterhouses, all these kind of port activities. And the people tended to stay in the middle and uh, ignore the waterfront. So that has an impact later on, both in trying to redevelop this land, also because the city subway system wasn't designed to reach a lot of these waterfront areas. And that later hindered a lot of the redevelopment of the, of the space. So this is the type of uses that were there. These gantry cranes uh, on the top are actually still there and have been incorporated into the design of the park there now. Rail lines ran right to the waterfront, and then these cranes were used to transfer uh, materials from, from rail to barge for transport between Manhattan and Long Island and other areas. Um, this site was also specifically home of a Pepsi bottling plant eventually, an oil refinery, um, a lot of coal tar production, so some uh, what turned out to be some messy uses. Uh, as I said, this turned, turned into a partnership between the state of New York, the city of New York, and the Port Authority, which is a bi-state agency here, New, New Jersey and New York. It's also a public-private partnership, so a lot of the financing uh, came from private developers as well. It was 74 acres. Uh, it was initially planned to be built out in four stages. Uh, the two, the stages three and four, which were the bottom half, eventually got turned over to the city and is now part of a separate project called Hunters Point South. Um, but the two northern sections uh, have been filled out and are now completed. Uh, so regarding the envisioning, the planning uh, effort, I just listed some of the milestones here. A lot of what I hear now from people is I was driving up the FDR and I, all these buildings popping up over near the Pepsi sign. I can't believe how quickly it's happening. But actually, as a lot of us know, the planning takes a lot longer than the construction of the buildings. Uh, so, going all the way back to 1982 was when this site was first identified by city planning, the city, as a, a site for re reuse, a waterfront development site um, that was prioritized for reuse. Uh, there were a lot of jurisdiction issues here. Some of the land was owned by the city, some by the state, some by private uh, entities. So eventually a decision was made to form a new subsidiary of the state that would be run by the city, the state, and the Port Authority. That was called Queens West Development Corporation. Uh, planning efforts went on in the mid, mid 80s. This involved a lot of uh, community input, figuring out what uses should be there, uh, defining what the development parcels would be, what would be, what would be parkland, uh, all of the infrastructure needed to be built, the streets, the utilities, you know, sewers, all, all of that needed to be built. Uh, and then there was a long environmental review process, especially since this was a heavily contaminated site. But all the planning involved with how many people are going to live here, how many schools are needed, what transportation is needed, uh, that went on and findings were ultimately uh, concluded in 1991 for environment, the environmental review. Uh, the first buildings in phase one, the first building was completed in 97. The park, first section of park opened in 98. Um, after that, there was a bit of a lull in development, partially because of economic conditions, but also during that time, the city uh, became focused on trying to get the uh, 2012 Olympics. Um, that started in the early 2000s. And this second half of this project was seen as a, you know, it was about 30 acres of vacant land right across from Midtown. So this was intended to be the Olympic Village and plans were put on hold for quite, quite a few years here. Uh, when that didn't come through, the city started to rethink the use of this and ultimately uh, there was, you know, what I call a friendly divorce where the city and the state separated. The city got the south, the state got the north. Uh, that's now Hunters Point South. There's 5,000 units of housing being developed down there, affordable housing, and the state finished out construction of the north. Oh, and I also wanted to mention the, the last of the residential buildings on the north just opened two weeks ago. So all of the buildings are open. There's 12 acres of park that's been completed. There's two, two public schools and all of the infrastructure. Um, just some quick parts of the financial deal. 
Uh, the land in this phase two of the project was actually purchased by Rock Rose, the developer, from Pepsi, who is the landowner, um, at their cost, but it was turned over at no cost to the state, uh, and Queens West became the owner. That was done in part to benefit from uh, incentives the state could offer by, by being the owner of the land. 50% uh, of the cost of all the public infrastructure that was needed, the utilities, the park, was paid by Rock Rose, the developer. The remainder was paid uh, by the Port Authority. The uh, developers were also responsible for the environmental remediation, which was a major component of this project, and it was really what was, was held up development here for a long time. Uh, ultimately, that turned into about an $85 million project remediating this site. There was uh, 80,000 80, cubic tons of soil removed from the site, clean soil brought in, removal of tanks and piping and oil spills. There was a lot, a lot to deal with there, but it's, it's now one of the cleanest places you can live in, in New York. Uh, Queens West eventually executed seven separate leases for the northern phase with Rock Rose. There was an RFP that was done for a developer all together, all of these sites, and Rock Rose was awarded all seven sites. Um, with those leases, there was also a general project plan developed for this area, which we call a GPP, which is a state, state has the power to uh, develop these GPPs. Uh, they can be used for a lot of different reasons, but in this case, a lot of it was to override the existing zoning, which was all manufacturing. Uh, GPP lays out what can be developed on each site, and Developers then follow that. They don't follow city zoning. Um, and just quickly, other parts of the financial structure, there is no property tax there because it's city owned. There's a pilot payment in lieu of taxes. The money does go to the city, Department of Finance, but it, for about 20 years, it's very low. Uh, eventually, it gets ramped up after 25 years to full property taxes, but at that time, the developers can purchase the buildings for a nominal amount. Um, there's other incentives like uh, they don't pay mortgage recording tax, sales tax on construction materials, um, other benefits. Developers also pay uh, for the maintenance of the park. There's a fee that is based on the square footage of residential space that pays to fully fund the operations of the park. Um, and uh, that's, uh, that's the basis of it. This is just some photos of the park that's been completed. This is a condo building, which uh, is now one of, I think it is the highest, uh, most expensive condos in Queens. They face the skyline, this park in front of them. So some of the parks, playgrounds. Again, there's 12 acres of waterfront park. Uh, altogether, there's about 5,000 units of housing. Most of it is uh, rental buildings, but some of it is condo and co-ops. Uh, the second phase had about 3 million square feet of floor area, residential floor area. The whole two phases are, are close to uh, 5 million square feet. It's a lot of housing. And uh, I think that's it. So I also prefer to stand. Uh, hi, I'm Greg Vaca. I'm Director of Acquisitions for Tishman Spire in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, so I, I thought it'd be helpful to give you all a background on the real estate industry in Brazil because it, it, it functions in a very different way uh, than it does here in New York and in, in other places around the world. But it's basically a market, Rio de Janeiro, that is it's defined by its limitations, right? When you look at this, I mean, this is the landscape of the city. This is what everybody comes to Rio for. I mean, it's gorgeous. You have wonderful urban beaches. It's been called Manhattan on the beach. Uh, you also have, as was said on this panel, you have a, a national forest that has the Christ the Redeemer statue and the Sugarloaf Mountain with the cable car and all, this, all these great amenities. But when you think about it from a real estate perspective, these are enormous restrictions, right? So you have a city that, and it's become very cliche to say this, but it's a city where you know, the water meets the mountains. So where do people live? They can't live on the water. They, a, lot of them have gone, a lot of people have gone up the mountains in informal uh, residential called favelas, right, the slums. Uh, but where do you actually develop property? Right? So this, is, this has been a historical problem that over time has pushed people farther and farther away from the city center. 
Uh, only the, what was produced far from the city center was extremely suburban in nature and not very attractive, especially to the new generation that doesn't want to get in a car and drive two hours um, into the city center. So this is the principal restriction on development in Rio de Janeiro is geographical. Now you go from that beautiful image to lovely downtown Rio de Janeiro. Uh, this is very typical of Rio de Janeiro office space. So you look at these buildings and you think, okay, you know, you have all this beauty, this natural beauty, and then you, this is what, you know, 65% of the stock is in downtown, uh, half of the stock, about 45% of the stock of all office space doesn't have central air. In New York, that would be a problem. Uh, in Rio de Janeiro, where in the winter it's 85 degrees and sunny, that's, a, that's just, you know, a major problem. And, that, and not just for air conditioning costs, but also for, you think about sustainability, energy use, block, you know, blackouts, etc. It's a major problem. So, you know, why is it that if you have all these high barriers to entry, which in Manhattan create fantastic skyscrapers, very high-end property, why has that not happened in Brazil? So the reason is financing. Uh, you look at these buildings here, these are all fractionally owned, right? Well, what does that mean? That means, okay, you had land, no, f no commercial financing is available. Uh, you wanted to build an office building, but you don't have the money to do it. So what do you do? You put up a little sales office, you launch the project to the general public, and you try to sell 50, 70% of the units. Some of the units are as small as 250 square feet. Uh, in order to take those proceeds and to build the building, to finance the building. So that sounds good, you know, so for somebody who wants to hedge against inflation, you, real estate's always a great option, so they sell very well. But then what happens 40 years later, right? What happens when you have 200 owners in one building and it's time to do some critical maintenance on, on the facade or the elevatoring or anything? Uh, here, and because of uh, the way the Brazilian legal system works, you can't even find a lot of these owners because the property is passed down, you know, through generations, and the you know the, the ancestors live in uh, Europe or somewhere else, and and so what happens? No one's going to put money into the building unless everyone does. So some of these buildings fall into disrepair and literally fall over, which is something that you've had uh, happen in the center of Brazil, in the center of uh, of Rio. Buildings literally collapse on themselves because people are making structural changes uh, to the building without anybody, without checking uh, what the guy upstairs is doing, right? So then he brings in some, um, some concrete to fix up his space and the building collapses. So this is a major problem. Uh, it's also a major opportunity uh, because you have a lot of these buildings have class A tenants in class C space, uh, right? So you get to the next restriction, which is landmarking. That's actually a good restriction. You want to you know, preserve all this beautiful space, but the zoning has caused these canyon walls uh, of office space, and behind them you have all these beautiful buildings that, uh, you know, most of them are in disrepair, you know, you don't have uh, the financing to, to refurbish these properties, so you wind up having a, a really a dead zone. I mean, this area in specific has some great retail during the day, uh, but you wind up having a downtown where nobody lives. So, you know, we're so used to thinking uh, you, you want to be close to the infrastructure. You know, in New York, how, how far away you are from the subway determines how much your real estate's worth, and in most cities. Uh, but here, where the metro goes to downtown, nobody lives. Until recently, a lot of these areas, it was illegal to do uh, by zoning residential. So can you imagine the consequences of this? You have 65% of the office space in an area where nobody lives, right? But this is all cliche. You know, you talk about Rio, there, there's no space, uh, but is there? It, it turns out that there is space. So this, this image, it seems, uh, has not uh, adapted well to the projecting. But if you imagine the traditional downtown is in this yellow space, right, with the major arteries of Rio Branco and Presidente Vargas, uh, where all this office space is, is, uh, exists, and, as well as all these landmark buildings. So, in a city with no space, it's kind of interesting that it took decades to realize there's five million square meters of space just on the other side of the principal commercial avenue in Rio. So, what about all the decades of, oh, there's no space, so you've got to build buildings one up next? No, look at all this. You go to the north, to the whole port zone, you have an area the size of the whole downtown that's abandoned old warehouses. 
that's close to infrastructure, that's on the waterfront, right? You heard a little talk about the perimeter highway. The perimeter highway restricted people's access from the waterfront. Only now that the perimeter highway is being demolished, you actually see that this is a waterfront city. And people are starting to wake up to this, to this uh, realization. So it turns out that all along there was you know, five million square meters of, of space. So what was the plan? The plan was, hey, let's take all this space that was all infill, as you saw in some of the images earlier, and let's zone it for modern office buildings. So not office buildings that are, you know, you know if, as you saw on that avenue, one right next to the, the other. Uh, the back view is usually to another building, which in New York you're all very familiar with. You know, you, you live in an apartment building where you can see your neighbor out, outside of your window. Uh, but you think about modern office space, you only have one viewed facade, right? So natural light doesn't really exist. Uh, the windows you do have are filled with air conditioners. Uh, so where are you going to build this you know, new property, new modern high-rise property? It, it's this zone. This is naturally going to be uh, the continuation of downtown, but also more than that, it's going to be the downtown. Uh, this is not just you know, an improvement on what went wrong. This is you know, the center, the new center of Rio. So this is a project we're doing with Foster and Partners. Uh, as you see, and you know, if we had more time, we could go into more detail, but here we took what was zoned as a dead end street and turned it into what will be a beautiful plaza um, where that, that, those sorts of negotiations uh, were impossible to have on property in other parts of downtown, but because you have a special port authority uh, that manages this development, uh, you were able to say, hey, Let's, let's scrap the dead-end street, let's put in a beautiful plaza. Uh, you know, there's light rail infrastructure. This, this, was, this case is the largest uh, waterfront property in, in the port zone. Um, I'll just go quickly. How is this all possible? I'm not going to steal you know, the presentation from, from some people we'll talk later, but it's all financed through the sale of F FAR, of property rights. So this is an urban operation, which means you know, specifically all of the FAR sale has to go into infrastructure within this same zone uh, and you know this it seems so logical now this is something that started at least in Brazil it started in Sao Paulo and now it's being exported everywhere uh, but this is this is me this mechanism is how you assure uh, that this all gets built so the, the infrastructure is guaranteed by the sale of, of additional uh, potential right uh, this image was actually already used at this conference but so what is it where does the money go it goes into what will be the premier underground infrastructure in Rio, so no more overhead wires, uh, you know, everything underground, uh, you know, so no more flooding, et cetera, fiber optics, which don't even exist uh, elsewhere. There's an elaborate light rail network uh, that links up all of the nodes. So you have the ferry, which now ferries 600,000 people a day uh, to the sister city of Niteroi, uh, the regional rail, various uh, metro stations, uh, the most important uh, bus station uh, in the city. All of this will now be hooked up into this light rail system, which goes directly into the core of downtown as well. And I'll leave you with this image. This may not say too much to you, but this is the most important image for the future of Rio. Uh, it's how you link up the extension of the metro line with the BRT lines and what creates what we call a new centrality. And the new centrality is that the downtown is moving to the port zone um, and it is the place that's going to have the easiest access to where the development has gone over uh, the last 50 years, which is out into the West Zone, which today does not have any, any mass transit. So, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you all. Um, w one of the places I wanted to start is your private responsibilities as developers versus the responsibilities of the public. And you went through some of that, Paul, in terms of the financing um, that you talked about. But we've had examples here in New York, for instance, of the government owning a piece of land where the government says, okay, we're going to build the infrastructure and then we're going to uh, parcel out the developments to different developers and try to maximize value. A lot of risk entailed for the government to do that. We've had the opposite scenario where we've handed it all over to a developer or a group of developers and had them build the infrastructure and had them build it piece by piece. And there are a lot of questions about whether you get consistency, whether you get reliability, whether you get the right kind of public access. I'm just wondering, as you're looking at your various waterfront parcels, how you're engaged with the government on those issues. Um, well, in our, in, in our project, we are doing all the infrastructure. Uh, so the government is not uh, 
uh, providing any infrastructure. Uh, but I think uh, our, our main responsibility, especially in our pro project, is uh, comes from uh, building uh, a project that fits into the city, that is representing Istanbul, that's representing the historic city, um, and uh, that's really adding to the city life. Well, isn't that the question when when the uh when, the, when, when you're building all the infrastructure, are there questions about whether there is a feeling that somehow when you've crossed into your development that you've left what feels like the rest of the city of Istanbul and, and have crossed into a, a new and different place as a consequence of the fact that you're building the infrastructure? That, that, that's a very good point. I, I, we are trying to be very careful uh, by designing our project on the waterfront to be understated so that it fits into the rest of the city. We don't want to build something that feels um, like Mumbai or that feels like Singapore or that feels like Dubai or New York. It has to feel Istanbul. Mm -hmm. And uh, so all the infrastructure, all the design, all of it is uh, fitting into Istanbul. So when you take those buildings out, people should say, this is Istanbul and it should be in Istanbul. Okay. you have thoughts on this? Uh, the, uh, in, in India is very large, so we need a mix of both. But typically, uh, government will step in uh, and do the infrastructure when they own the land. Uh, if the government owns the land, they're definitely going to do the infrastructure themselves. They're not going to give it to anybody in India. But if they're going to acquire private land, that is a big cost of money. And if they're going to acquire even from individual farmers, the government can do it better than the private developer in terms of you know issuing notices and getting finding the, who are the owners and where are the relatives and everybody. But at the same time, they need a lot of cash to hand out to the farmers and <coughs> traditional landowners or even the urban areas. So you have to get the private sector in uh, when there will be pri uh, private lands. So and then you know there's no money for infrastructure. Well, and you, you, you also though you, you made a very specific comment about the waterfront uh, kind of promenade that the government built versus your high street. Uh, and that the high street was actually quite successful, had a lot of retail and activity. Exactly, exactly, you do. And uh, is that because you felt that... You, no, you but like the, the government, government has created hawker zones on the beaches and they're very uh, important for the, uh, you know, the, uh, the beach. I mean, people, if there's no hawker zone there, it would die, you know. I mean, people would, uh, it would be a rampant illegal activity going on. So uh, it's, uh, you know, when they reclaim land, it's going to be government land, isn't it? Okay, if they reclaim land, uh, mm -hmm. the government is going to do the infrastructure. Hopefully, they do it, uh, as I said, uh, transit-oriented development, mm -hmm. non-automobile based, zero car parking, zero private automobile car parking. And there you go, and then you auction the land. Right. We, of course, can't, <laughs> reclaim, we, we can't reclaim land here, uh, uh, which is something that we should probably uh, invest in But you further. have traditionally. We have traditionally, oh, straight you into build, the 1980s, yes, we have. Yeah, so we are still young uh, country. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're still early stages. Greg, what are, you, what are your, I mean, you just yeah, described they, an enormous amount of infrastructure. Enorm right, so it, it's a very novel way that it, it was done in, in Rio, and uh, it was, it, it's this concept of an urban operation which was very successful, but if you, when you throw, usually how this is done, is you auction off FAR, and that the proceeds from that auction go to invest incrementally in infrastructure. Uh, in this case, we, we didn't have the luxury of time. That that takes decades for the for the for the uh, FAR to get value to the point where it can pay for the infrastructure. In this case, you need everything done by 2016. Mm -hmm. In Rio, 2016 is a magical number. Everything happens in 2016. I don't think anything happens before 2016. Who knows what's going to happen after? But that that's the year of the Olympics. Right, so everything had to be done. The entire infrastructure project had to be done for 2016. So how do you do that? Enter our partners at the Federal Bank, uh, who, uh, with uh, what they call the Fundo de Garantia, which is like the Social Security, uh, they invested in all of the. They will pay for all of the in infrastructure, about eight billion reais, about so three and a half billion dollars in infrastructure, and all of that FAR. Uh, that was caused by downzoning. So they downzone everything to one-time FAR, and then they upzoned when you buy these FAR mm -hmm. uh, titles up to as high as 12 times. All of that money goes into the into the infrastructure, right? So the infrastructure had to be done over a very short timeline. So it gives 
developers, you know, a, a lot of security. When you can walk around the port zone, you see that everything is already happening. The tunnels are already fully dug. You know, Which the government is building. No, so that the eight billion reais uh, went to pay for what's called a public-private partnership. So basically, they hired a consortium of, of Rio and Brazil's three biggest construction companies that will not only execute all of the infrastructure, so the tunnels, all the new roads, the, uh, all the underground piping and cabling, all of that, but they then will have a 10-year contract to maintain it. So I think what they've done it very intelligently, it, it, it wouldn't work in New York maybe, but it, they've removed government from the equation. Right, so who's going to be, you know, collecting the garbage? In this case, it's probably going to be this, you know, the same company. But, you know, changing the light bulbs, you know, ma maintenance, all everything is going to be this consort, this this but construction does that consortium. But how the public infrastructure can be used? In other words, is that space policed differently? Is it? It uh, is. It is. It's actually uh, this. There are going to be cameras in, you know, the, the security project of the port zone is extremely elaborate in terms of security in terms of monitoring, which that's a whole other question. And, you know, it gets into, okay, is that, is the port zone going to be the basis for redeveloping the old downtown to, for the rest of the city, perhaps? Because uh, the infrastructure we're talking about in terms of security cameras, fiber optic, it doesn't exist in the city anywhere. So the idea is to use this as a template and then bring it into the rest of the city. Now, will it feel a little different than downtown? For sure. You know, it, it will feel like a much nicer cleaner environment than, you know, you currently have in downtown, but the idea is then to have a second revitalization of, of the existing downtown. Okay. Uh, Queens West, it, it was a real public-private partnership. Their financial responsibilities were very intertwined. Uh, part of that was because you had a, a lot of big upfront expenses. You had to build all the utilities before you could do anything. You had to do this huge cleanup before you could do anything. So it wasn't something a private developer would be able to undertake. And even though now it seems like building Tower on the Waterfront in Queens is a home run, it, it, even 10 years ago it wasn't, uh, it was very risky and to make such big investments there uh, was hard. So the, the state and the city were needed. Um, I think it was broken up pretty well. I'm sure things would have been done differently if we could start over, but in general, it, there was there was co financial commitments from all the different parties, um, and I think they're all benefiting now. There's a, a great park there that's funded by the development. There's um, the redevelopment has really spread beyond this site to all of Long Island City now, which is a real booming uh, real estate market, and uh, so it was a it was a shared. Paul, I wonder what you think about. On the question of use, something that I was very struck by in all three of your presentations is that you talked about a mixed-use waterfront in various ways. Um, and yet, you know, the, the de Blasio administration, our new mayor has, and, and, and Alicia Glenn, the deputy mayor, has been kind of critical of some of the development that we've seen on the, on the Brooklyn and Queens waterfront, that it's basically a big residential tower with kind of a grocery store or a, right. maybe a drugstore on the bottom, and right. somehow that's mixed-use. Whereas in all of these other environments, we seem to see people where, where places where people can both work and live, uh, as well as you know cultural facilities, hotels, and so forth. Has did, did did we somehow go wrong as a city in terms of how mono use this waterfronts become compared to uh, these international cities? Well, definitely now I think planning has evolved, and that is what's desired is very truly mixed use communities where people are living and working together. Um, at this time, this all, there, were, there were commercial components planned here, and the market just didn't, uh, couldn't support them at the time. The, one of the whole sections that's residential now was meant to be commercial towers. Um, some of that was the market. Some of that were, were these transportation issues where people are willing to walk further to the subway to their home than they are to their office, and we just really couldn't attract big office buildings over here. So I think if we were planning it, over, we'd plan it differently, but this is part of uh, what could happen where we, where we could get private investment uh, to make the project happen. And uh, I think gradually it is evolving into more of an integrated community and other, other commercial uh, buildings are starting to come over there and hopefully that will, it will evolve into more of a mixed use area. So just before I open it up to questions, uh, I had one last question, which is there wasn't a lot of mention in your presentations about sea level rise. 
And I'm just wondering how you're all thinking about this, given that you're developing right on the water and that there's a lot of risk associated with this and so forth. Yeah, I, I've been excited about it because, uh, because it's, uh, you know, interesting. You're to excited about sea level rise? <laughs> <laughs> excited in the sense that uh, of the subject, uh, you know, as a subject. So uh, the, uh, you know, in this project in Chennai, which is on the creek. Uh, of course, the, we have the whole Indian Ocean just at the end of the creek. Uh, we raised everything by three meters. We kept the car parking in the clubhouse at the lower level. So the whole uh, development, the lobby level is three meters higher. That's as, but, but now they say talking, and they said, a, you know, now they're talking about 10 meter high but don't you worry rise about in how global that, levels. Don't you worry about how that impacts the street? Uh, no, this was on the water side. The streets are... Uh, or, uh, well, or on the waterfront then. Yeah. Don't you we worry sort of about what it feels we like? We sloped the roads to the waterfront. We sloped them down. So you enter the buildings here. It's a large development. And we sloped it down three meters down to the road, uh, the, wa uh, the waterfront road. Hmm. So we enter from the buildings from here. And below is the car park and the clubhouse, which opens into the open space of the... But... Uh, I mean, uh, whatever I can understand is that we are, uh, everybody's designing for storm surges. Nobody's uh, designing for Antarctica melting or Greenland melting. Every, everybody's just designing for storm surges, you know. The, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The Sir, Dary, have you had to put a lot of thought into that in terms of your project? Uh, no, uh, because uh, and unfortunately Istanbul is not prepared for that. Uh, if something like that happens in Istanbul, we're in big trouble. <laughs> I, I, I mean, it's, it's the, way, the, the way the city is structured. We cannot raise our project because we have buildings right behind it. Actually, Studio X is right behind it. So they will be the first to protest. And so uh, that's the way the city is structured. So we have the uh, channel of city pass uh, water passing through the city. So if the water rises, the city is in trouble. Is there talk of, uh, of sea gates on the Bosphorus? No. <laughs> You know, gotta ask a fun question. Come on, Kate. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> the Porto Maravilla project in in Rio de Janeiro was. I don't remember the exact numbers, but it it was structured to consider certain uh, sea, rise in sea level. So, and it, you know, as it is, as, it's all infill, right? So right. it sort of goes to the challenge of building there. I mean, this is all dirt, and the water is just you know a meter below you. Right, so that's its own building challenge since you need to anchor into the bedrock, which is similar. It's a granite rock. Uh, so, but you have to go 15 meters down when water is just one meter down. So water is you know, your, your best asset in terms of value, but it's also, a, you know, from the, starting in the construction phase, it's a huge problem, mm -hmm. right? Getting the water, keeping it dewatered, you know, uh, building the slurry walls, et cetera. But it's actually higher than the sea level on the bay, uh -huh. uh, the port zone. So there is a, and it was, it, that was actually considered in the project. Oh. Which, um, Queens West, you know, was planned so long ago, I can't say they took climate change into consideration, but actually there were issues there that forced the developers to address a lot of it. There was a very high water table, so none of the buildings have basements there. A lot of the utilities that would normally be in basements are raised above, so there was, there was the park does have berms around some of the buildings which prevented uh, water rising. So it fared pretty well. Um, our other buildings, Rock Rose buildings, we have uh, buildings in uh, Battery Park City, downtown. Uh, generally, we were pretty lucky, even in Battery Park City. I mean, the, the odd thing is a lot of the newer buildings that were built on, water, on the waterfront w received less damage in some of the older communities because some of these things were, were planned for. Our Battery Park City buildings didn't even lose power. They didn't have any water, mm -hmm. even though they're right, right on the water. So, but it, it has caused us to look at all of our buildings and see what we can do and should we diversify. And uh, it's definitely a consideration now. Okay. Um, we have time for maybe one or two questions. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, my question is to Mr. Bilgili because I'm part of the Istanbul team. Uh, two questions. One, a smaller one, which interests me very much. You mentioned that, well, you used the word the warehouses are ugly and they will be demolished. Uh, as you probably know, they are actually by uh, Turkey's most famous modern architect, Sedat Eldam, and at least on the street front, there is a facade that 
is rather important. So my question is, were there any studies of retrofitting or uh, repurposing or before that decision was taken? Um, so that's the little question. And the larger one is, you talked about creating public space. Of course, this is now the keyword everywhere. But uh, what is public space and which public we are talking about is a huge, huge issue. And the way I will formulate the question is, um, you talk about public space and you mentioned it will be retail offices, uh, residences, and uh, luxury hotel. And uh, the image that comes to mind, and you know, looking at the perspectives as well, uh, what kind of measures were built into this to make this affordable to certainly the local communities, small businesses, etc. Because otherwise, if it's another Zorlu Center or Canyon, which may make more sense in Maslak or Levant, which is the new CBD. But this place, as you said, is the heart of historic city. So you did talk about the importance of the historic uh, city. But frankly, it's hard to see it looking at the perspectives or the programmatic, uh, uh, the program that you outlined. So I'm just curious if there were any attempts to uh, bring in small businesses, local communities, or is this just going to be a very high-end complex? Thank you so much. Uh, first of all, yes, I definitely know that these uh, warehouses are uh, built and designed by one of the most important architects of Turkish history, Sedatak Eldem. But unfortunately, when you look at the photograph, I don't think they really reflect the best work of Sedatak Eldem. I'm not in the position to uh, discuss that here, but uh, this was a decision. As you know, this property uh, is auctioned by the government. We were the highest bidders. Uh, with Doge Holding, who's uh, one of the largest conglomerates in Turkey, and uh, actually it's a 30 year uh, uh, long lease uh, or a concession of use of these properties. So, in this, it includes the demolition of all those uh, buildings because when you look at those buildings, it's not really the best use of the space either. Um, so, coming to your second question, this property is about 120,000 square meter land. Uh, and right now, that 1.2 kilometer of waterfront is completely close to public use. So first of all, we are opening 1.2 kilometer of uh, waterfront for complete public use. Secondly, we are putting two separate parks, which are totaling about uh, 35,000 square meters, which will be used as a public space and designed as a public space. Now, coming to the uh, commercial side of this, of course, when I talk to people in Istanbul, they all ask, oh, are you going to make uh, public spaces, galleries, uh, places for public? But you should know that we have paid $720 million. We are investing another $450 million. So the total is $1.2 billion. And I have to make that money back in 30 years. So and um, these kind of developments I have to look at the commercial side. So is it going to be only Louis Vuitton's, Gucci's, Prada's? No, definitely not. It will be um, because we have about uh, 65,000 square meter of retail space. So it will be a very wide range of uh, retail. And it will be the new uh, high street shopping of Istanbul. So in high street shopping, it's not going to be uh, only high-end stores like in Zorlu, But we will have uh, a very uh, wide variety of uh, retail, restaurants, uh, bars, and public spaces. So it's, it's going to be open to public. But for the business purpose and for commercial purposes, we will try to maximize our income uh, so that we will we get paid on our investments for sure. OK. Maybe, should we cut it off or one last cut? All right, uh, quick question uh, over on the left, please. Um, my question's for Mr. Hiranandani. Uh, you started by saying that uh, if you could, you would change something about the project given today. Uh, would one of those changes have been the high street and the public spaces, which are completely enclosed by the towers and not oriented towards the waterfront? And uh, were there financial reasons or rules and regulations which restricted it? Because I know you couldn't build on the waterfront, given the activists in the government, but those spaces could have been oriented towards it. So what was 
Do no, no. All, all the public spaces are open to the public. Some of them where we have water bodies and we put water boats with uh, koi carp in the, them. Uh, we charge five rupees, which is like one cent or something. Yeah, but I think, I think he's asking uh, about entry. whether the buildings are oriented towards the high street or towards the water. Yeah, yeah because all no, no, the buildings... No, no. Uh, it's a lake. There's a, you know, a major highway running around the lake, which feeds into our project. Uh, I don't own land abutting the lake, very little bit abutting the road, which I'd rather be a little away from that road because it's a highway and it's a noise of cars. You want to be away from that uh, highway and yet look at the lake. That's the most prime. Yeah, no, I was asking okay. would the high street and the public spaces... The be public more spaces mo are within, which we have created about the roads within the project, which are public roads. They are not private roads, it's not a gated community. We have public transit buses running through the project. Even on so-called private I think your roads. your question today. points to this kind of tricky issue, which is retail likes to face each other, and waterfront retail is always difficult because of that thing challenge. of, that it's challenge of just facing retail out to so the water. I, I would say, why not like Alexandria, just a perpendicular waterfront uh, high street, and then you enjoy a little bit of the water also. And Let's use New York examples, no Alexandria. <laughs> uh, thank you very much to this terrific panel. Thank you.